Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today, Why Black History Matters, the Importance of Reconstruction in Today's Classroom and Libraries. And I've, I'm joined by the wonderful Rita Lorraine Hubbard and Michelle Coles. And they are going to be, um, they're going to be introducing themselves in a little bit. And I'm Katie Potter. I'm the Senior Literacy Manager at Lee and Low Books. And I'm going to be moderating the discussion today. Just as a reminder, the webinar is being recorded and the link to view the webinar and the reconstruction book list and resources are going to be shared within the week. So since everyone registered, you will be getting an email blast from us containing all of the, this um, wealth of information. You can also contact me, kpotter at leanlow.com for a certificate of completion. So to review our agenda today, we'll all be introducing ourselves telling you a little bit about us. And then we are really going to dive in into uh, reconstruction history. And Michelle is going to take us through the big picture. What is reconstruction and defining some key terminology and providing us with some other definitions that are critical to our understanding of reconstruction, which as we know, is a severely undertaught period of American history across this country. And so we're really excited to hear from her. We're also going to be discussing some core elements and pr principles about teaching reconstruction. Michelle will take us through those. And then we're going to um, hear from Rita Lorraine Hubbard from Hammering for Fr Freedom, a beautiful picture book. Our new voices award, it's a new voices award winner. And from middle and uh, high school, Michelle will be talking about her book, Black Was the Ink, that really dives into some wonderful reconstruction history. And we'll be concluding with the book list and resources and a question and answer. So thanks all for joining us. Um, so I am Katie. I am the Senior Literacy Manager at Lee and Low Books. I develop all the educator guides um, and the resources. And you have, if you've attended our webinars, you've seen me before. Um, so I work with nonprofit organizations, universities, and schools on incorporating diverse literature into their respective programs. And before Lee and Low, I was a teacher. I was an educational researcher. And I have my master's from Bing Street College of Education in Literacy and Childhood General Education. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Coles, and I am a debut novelist. I just, uh, my first book, Black Was the Ink, was recently published by Lee and Lowe Books. And I'm also a civil rights attorney and a mother of four. Um, I'm a ninth generation Louisianan. I grew up in, in Dallas but I'm originally from Louisiana and I um, attended Howard University School of Law. So I'm a very proud graduate of that school. And as you'll see, um, hopefully if you're able to dive into Black Was the Ink, Howard, as well as so many other historically black colleges and universities were founded in the reconstruction era. And I'm also a graduate of the University of Virginia. And my goal in writing is to empower young people by educating them about history and giving them the tools to shape their destiny. Thanks so much, Michelle. And on to Rita. Hello, everyone. I'm Rita Lorraine Hubbard. I'm a native Tennessean, and I am a former teacher of 20 years. I'm a special education teacher, now writing full-time for children. I do have two picture books. The one we're going to talk about today is Hammering for Freedom. Um, I would like to say that I am one of those people who has always believe that everybody deserves their 15 minutes of fame. So I'm one of those who wants to make sure that anyone who didn't get their first 15 minutes that first time around gets it this time around. So I love writing about unsung, and I mean really unsung heroes. Nice, Rita. I love that. So Michelle is going to take us through some key points about reconstruction, and we're just go we're going to hear from her, and she's going to give us all the background information. So go ahead, Michelle. Okay, so reconstruction was a really fascinating period in our country's history. Um, as everyone knows, when the country was founded uh, at the very beginning in 1776, 
um, America set out a lot of grand principles for what was going to define um, our, how our government was set up and what was going to define American citizenship. And so some of those principles were all men are created equal and equal justice under the law and um, people would have the opportunity to vote for who represents them in government. And all of those things are really wonderful and unique about America at its founding, but it didn't apply universally to all people on um, American soil. And in particular, it didn't apply to the uh, Africans and their descendants who were living in America at the time. Um, but a civil war was fought. And at the end of the civil war, uh, America faced a really tough decision and it was, what to do with the population of, of people of African descent who were living in this country. And at the time the Civil War ended and the decision was made to abolish slavery, there were 4.4 million African Americans um, that were freed from slavery. And uh, discussion um, took place as to whether should those people of African descent be sent to another country and, you know, a, a colony created for them and, and have them just be shipped away from America? Or should they gain all of the rights and privileges of citizenship? And so the latter position is the one that won out in Congress. And, um, and Congress passed a set of laws that for the very first time would allow African Americans to have all the rights of citizenship. Um, in this picture, this is, oh, I'm sorry, if we can go back one slide, I was just going to show in this picture, yeah. um, it's a picture from my book, Black Was the Ink, and it's a picture of the very first Black person being sworn in as a member of Congress, and his name was Hiram Rebels, and he was a senator from the state of Mississippi, and, um, and he was sworn in in 1870 um, to the United States Senate, and so that's an event that's discussed in my book. So Congress passed a set of three amendments to the United States Constitution that fundamentally altered uh, the American landscape. And these are known as the Reconstruction Amendments. Uh, the first of those is called the 13th Amendment, and it abolished slavery and involuntary ser servitude, except for those duly convicted of a crime. And so that last exception ended up being a pretty big loophole that um, was, was exploited um, through uh, convict leasing programs and, you know, even through mass incarceration today. But, um, but the 13th Amendment was intended to abolish slavery, and, and it largely... Um, in, in most parts did that at the time it was passed. Um, the second of the Reconstruction Amendments is called the 14th Amendment, and it gave US citizenship rights to all people who were born or naturalized in the United States. And so those citizens rights, citizenship rights included equal protection under the laws and due process protections. And the third of the Reconstruction Amendments is the 15th Amendment, and it prohibited the United States or any state from denying or abridging citizens' rights to vote on account of their race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And so this amendment was so important because um, it was intended to guarantee that all American citizens would have the right to, right to vote, uh, regardless of their race and regardless if they had ever been held in slavery. And so altogether, these three amendments were intended to um, ensure that African Americans would be treated as full citizens as the time they were passed. Mm. Michelle, do you wanna tell us a little bit about the illustration shown here? Yes. Um, so this illustration is, um, well, let me just back up to say, so as a result of these amendments, um, Black people were able to vote in the United States for, for political offices. They were able to run and they were elected in large numbers to political office for the very first time in, um, in American history. And in the 1870s alone, there were 16 Black members of Congress, all from Southern states. And, um, you know, an important thing to remember is the majority of the Southern states that had been a part of the Confederacy, their population was for most of them was about 50% black. And so, um, and so for these African-Americans that were elected, 
they were representing their communities that had never had a voice in the halls of Congress. And so this is actually a picture of, of um, one of the elected representatives named um, Robert Elliott. And he's arguing, I believe in this picture, he's arguing for the passage of, of either the Civil Rights Act of 1875 or the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. He argued very passionately and eloquently um, for the, pas uh, the passage of both of those bills. But um, it, was, it was quite a spectacle um, when, when he took the floor because for most of the people, you know, the, the white members of Congress, they had in their mind that black people were inferior and unintelligent and incapable of, of making persuasive arguments. And um, every time that Robert Elliott spoke um, from the from the House floor, um, it just it elicited, you know, applause and standing ovations because he was such an amazing uh, oral advocate. And and both of the, the bills that he was really passionate about, and that was the, the KKK Act, um, which gave federal enforcement for, um, to pursue um, domestic terrorists that were um, that were engaging in domestic terrorism to prevent black people from voting and engaging in terroristic activities. Um, he advocated for that and also for a civil rights bill that prohibited discrimination um, based on race in any place open to the public. And both of those bills passed. So it was a, it was a really interesting time. And, and again, my book covers the, the whole political um, uh, events that were occurring during the reconstruction era. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's amazing. To, to, to read and to see all of the research and documentation that you put into the book, Michelle. So thank you. Yeah, so, um, so, so some people may ask if all of these amazing things were happening um, in the reconstruction era, if you were seeing black people represented in Congress, there were several um, black Lieutenant governors in different Southern states. There was even one black person, PBS Pinchback, who uh, rose to being the governor, the very first African-American governor, and he was governor over the state of Louisiana for a short period. He was filling the term of the previous governor who resigned. Um, but if all of these amazing achievements were taking place in the 1870s, why haven't we seen more progress today? And why was there such a long gap between um, when the first of these events took place and before you would see a second black governor or an, a second um, uh, or an additional black member of Congress from the South or another civil rights bill, um, you know, that was passed in 1964 that was necessary to end the Jim Crow era and, um, and make sure that people weren't discriminated in public places. And the answer to that goes back to the wave of domestic terrorism that um, was plaguing the, the South and um, was targeting Black people to try to prevent them from engaging in um, voting and running from office and, and targeting their political involvement. And so the picture on the left is um, a political cartoon that uh, is is depicting um, a, a massacre called the Colfax Massacre. And there were just dozens and dozens, there were so many forgotten massacres that were taking place of Black people around the South in um, the Reconstruction era. And Colfax is just an example of one of them. Um, but Colfax is a very significant one because um, the, uh, the, the U U.S. Attorney's Office actually brought indictments against 100 um, Clans, well, they weren't clans, they were other, there were other domestic terrorist groups, but in shorthand, you could say clans, clans people. The US Attorney's Office brought um, indictments against a hundred of them and ended up convicting, I want to say seven. Um, but those individuals appealed their case, and their case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ended up issuing a ruling that um, caused the uh, KKK Act of, of um, 1871. Um, to be restricted in terms of how it would it would be applied, and it also limited the reach of the Fourteenth Amendment and its ability to protect Black people and their rights. And so it was a very consequential Supreme Court case that came out of this massacre, where um, hundreds of of Black people were killed in this town in Louisiana, um, largely because they were trying to protect the results of an election um, mm -hmm. that they voted in. So, um, so uh, 
Again, um, the picture on the right here, this was a letter um, sent by the KKK, and this is something that was published in a newspaper at that time um, in the 1870s. And it was actually sent to um, a black member of Congress named Joseph Ramey. And so he was the first African-American to serve in the US House of Representatives. And so um, this is you know, a threat that they were telling him that, you know, he needed to, he needed to leave. It says, you know, here the climate is too hot. Leave once forever. We are watching you. And so these are the types of threats that Black leaders were frequently receiving. And, um, and it didn't stop at threats. There were many um, Black leaders that were murdered and lynched in this period. Um, so this is, you know, those are the two sides of the reconstruction era is on one hand, you had a lot of amazing achievements um, and the very first time that African-Americans were accomplishing certain things. And, um, and you know, another example is there was a hotel in Washington, DC that was a very fine establishment and it was owned by a black man named James Wormley. It was called the Wormley Hotel. And, um, you know, all types of dignitaries would stay there and, you know, senators and, and it was a, you know, it's a hotel and a restaurant. And it's, it's almost unfathomable. It was directly across the street from the White House that something like this would even exist. I don't even know anything like that that exists today in 2021, but something like this existed in, 18, in the 1870s. And as I mentioned, so many historically black colleges and universities were founded in, in this period. And so there was a lot of um, hope and opportunity that uh, was taking place in this era, but there was also a tremendous amount of violence and domestic terrorism um, that eventually um, when the reconstruction era came to, the, came to an end, um, that was the, the violence um, ultimately succeeded in suppressing the gains that had been made in the Reconstruction era as the country pivoted towards the Jim Crow era. Mm. And so um, Reconstruction ultimately ended when federal troops were pulled from the South after uh, there was a disputed presidential election. And it was an election between Ruther B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden. And um, there, there was a, uh, in three different states, um, there were challenges about the outcome of the election. And, um, and that was in Florida, South Carolina, and Louisiana. And um, because of the number of challenges, it was, you know, some would say it was unclear who the winner of the election was. And so Congress ended up setting up a commission to, um, to make the decision on which electors they were gonna accept. And that commission, um, reached a compromise, which is known as the Hayes-Tilden Compromise of 1877. And reportedly, that uh, compromise was actually reached at the Wormley Hotel. So the, the person I just mentioned, the African-American James Wormley, who owned one of the nicest hotels in Washington, DC, that's where the commission met. And, um, and the commission was made up of uh, five members of the House of Representatives, five members of the United States Senate, and five men members of the Supreme Court. And, you know, obvious, I guess it's not obvious, but all the members on the commission were white males. And they ended up um, re making the decision that they were gonna allow um, Ruther B. Hayes to win the presidency. Um, and Ruther B. Hayes was the Republican candidate. And it, in that time, the Republican party was the party of Lincoln. Um, and, um, and so the party of Lincoln was also the party that was most in support of, um, of black people having full citizenship rights. Um, and so the compromise was struck that the Republican Ruther B. Hayes would win the election, but all the federal troops would be pulled out of the South. And the federal troops were really the only thing that was protecting African-Americans and, um, and you know, keep making sure that you know, they were able to vote without being killed or harassed or beaten. And so once the federal troops were pulled out of the South, there was no more protection that remained for African-Americans. They were really left at the mercy of the, um, the Southern states governments um, that were at this point largely run by um, former Confederate soldiers or people sympathetic with the Confederate cause. And, um, and because the government changed so drastically, um, they were able to um, modify 
uh, their state constitutions to eliminate all the gains that African Americans had made in the Reconstruction era. And so that's when you would see um, Jim, Crow, Jim Crow coming to existence in the laws that, um, you know, if, for example, things like the grandfather clause that said you could only vote if your grandfather could vote, or they would have a poll tax that would say, you know, you had to pay this tax to be able to vote. And most Black people having so recently come out of slavery did not have a lot of money and would not have been able to afford a poll tax. Or a literacy test is another example of a voting restriction. And again, with Black people coming out of generations of slavery where um, it, was, it was illegal um, for them to learn how to read, many Black people still did not know how to read so soon um, coming out of slavery. And so, um, and so, as I mentioned, in the 1870s, there were 16 Black members of Congress, and they were all elected from Southern states. After, uh, after Reconstruction ended, there was not a single Black person elected from a Southern state until uh, 19. 70, and that's after the Voting Rights Act was passed. Um, and, and there was a trinkle, there was, a, you know, it slowly trinkled down from, you know, at, at the height, there may have been like eight Black members of Congress at one time, and that number trinkled down all the way to about 1900, when there was one Black person in Congress, and then there were none um, for, for 70 years. And so um, that's a part of American history that I think largely gets glossed over. Oftentimes we talk about, you know, we talk, we, we acknowledge that there was a period of slavery. We acknowledge that a civil war was fought that resulted in ending slavery. And then we often talk about the civil rights movement where, um, you know, so many of the restrictions that were placed on Black people during the Jim Crow era finally came to an end. But uh, we often don't focus that much attention on the brief period of, of Reconstruction where um, Black people were um, ha had more opportunities to attain the American dream, and then also um, how that period came to an end and, um, and, and how the fabric of, of American society um, changed once again. And, and so that Black people's lives much closer resembled what they had experienced under slavery, um, again, for another, you know, 70 to 100 years. Wow. Wow, Michelle, thank you so much. And there is a lot to unpack there. Um, and I know that 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 we went through Michelle did such an amazing job at providing such such detailed information in just four slides. Um, and so, but it's on it's it's on us educators and librarians and parents and families to do the work into into teaching our children about this. Um, so these are some guiding questions that you can use to reflect on yourself, that you can have students working with you and answering in the, you know, in elementary grades, upper elementary grades, middle school, high school, um, and really just examining the path. These guiding questions examine the past, the what happened during the reconstruction and how that all ties back into present day. So thinking about what were the founding principles of American government, and then how do those principles align with a country that held more than 4 million people in slavery? And really getting, you know, getting educators, getting students to sit with that and to think about it and to process it. Um, back to what Michelle was talking about with citizenship, what are the core rights of US citizenship? And then, you know, during reconstruction, what attempts were made to make sure all citizens had equal access to these core rights? How were people in the, the government congressmen, people in the Senate, how were they all working to make sure that those rights were upheld? Michelle talked about reconstruction ending. Um, you know, why did reconstruction end? How is it remembered? How is it taught? And then, you know, what lessons does reconstruction and its collapse hold for us today? How does reconstruction tie into present day? How does what happened during reconstruction really reflect on what's going on now? Um, so these are some guiding questions that I hope you can use when you're developing your, your curriculum, when you're teaching um, any subject for that matter, um, relating to American history. And with that, you know, Michelle ended on, um, you know, how reconstruction, 
how black people were able to achieve some success and then also experienced you know collapse because of white supremacy and and everything that the government was doing to work against them and so Rita is going to share with us the story of Bill Lewis which kind of ties in some of those um some of that historical information and she's going to really take us through Bill's story um so Rita take it away all right we'll do well first of all let me say that um, the story of William Lewis is one of the most inspirational that I've ever come across. And I wasn't even looking for him. I was actually working on another project when I ran across his name in the footnotes of something else that I was reading. And when I read that this enslaved man rented himself and then went on for the next 20 or more years uh, freeing himself and his wife, his son, and the rest of his family members, I was just blown away. And I had to know his story. Um, I will tell you there are pitfalls that come with writing uh, nonfiction bios like this one. Uh, most Black history, when I was growing up, uh, we always covered people that we had already covered. Not that that's a bad thing, but it was always a Black figure that everyone had heard of. But what I found, starting with William, was that there were so many stories out there that had not been told yet, that were amazing stories that helped tie this whole thing called history together. One of the pitfalls was that um, since he was really, truly, an unsung hero, I didn't really know where to begin with him. So I started with that footnote that I found and um, I looked at some early history books from Chattanooga. And one of the history books had um, a lengthy uh, paragraph about him. And so I looked at the name of the author. The book had been written like in the sixties. I don't know why I assumed the author was dead that was a prejudice on my part, but um, I called the local publishing company. It was a, a local newspaper that had published that book. And when I called them um, to see if they could put me in touch with the author's family so I could learn more, the author answered the phone at this publishing company. And he and I ended up having a long, long talk about William Lewis he told me about newspaper articles he had written. He told me which books to go look for in the library. Most of them were um, out, of, um, out of circulation. Some of them were actually out of print and falling apart and in the special rare books room. <clears throat> but he also had a, um, a box that he had donated to the library where he had done all of his research, talked to all of William's family. So um, even though I pulled his story together sort of piecemeal and it took a long time, we're not talking about a month or two. I think it took maybe two or three years to pull everything together. Um, it was not easy because this was truly an unsung hero. Um, so I will tell you if you ever decide to write a bio about somebody who really isn't one of those we've heard of, you know, one of the African American figures that we've heard of, then it's probably going to take you a little while, but stick with it, do your detective work, and it'll all begin to come together. For me, it was like, um, it was like stitching a, a patchwork quilt, but doing it hands on without any instruction. Um, but I did enjoy it. It just was very strenuous. I will tell you, I have been listening to um, Michelle when she was talking about her book and all of those lovely illustrations. And those illustrations are what I remember about Reconstruction. And here's what I mean. You know, we, we do hear a lot about slavery. We're in America, we're saturated on slavery. And we hear a lot about uh, early freedom, like the early marches and March on Washington and on Selma and 
the civil rights marches, we hear all of that. But when we talk about reconstruction, we don't really talk about it. We just kind of mention it and then move on. You know, it's, it's as if, you know, hey, here today, gone, gone tomorrow. So when I saw those beautiful pictures, I was thinking this brings back memories of what I remember about Reconstruction, which is all of the African-Americans who made it into um, a position of some sort, a, a, a commissioner, a, um, a public servant, a senator, or whatever they made it to. We hear about them, but we don't hear about the African-Americans who lived through Reconstruction, who didn't have that kind of power or clout. We don't hear about that. You know, and so for me, um, William's story is sort of the exact opposite of Michelle's story because he was one of those everyday sort of unknown persons. He, he was popular in Chattanooga, but he was not a commissioner. He was not a public figure. He was just a, a slave who had been forward thinking enough to rent himself, eventually pay for his wife and himself there he is holding his free papers. Um, but he was forward thinking enough to do that. But he was living in everyday life like most African-Americans were. Most African-Americans didn't even know the efforts that were um, being made to try to make strides for African-Americans. They were just trying to live. That's what they were trying to do. And William was one of those. I will say that... Um, William was forward thinking enough that he um, ended up with several blacksmith shops, all of which needed to be manned. So he hired not only other black people, but he hired white people too. And this was during slavery, which was what made it so amazing. He um, was well known in the community um, as someone who brought both of the races together. People trusted him and people really looked up to him. He made a considerable fortune. Now, it, the numbers don't sound so great in our day and time, but at one point, for instance, he, um, he was reported to have earned like $1,500 in a year. That was a lot of money for back in the 1800s. Within 10 years, he was up to almost $10,000. I think it was something like 75, eight or $8,000. So his, his fortune was just expanding, but along comes the, it, the Civil War. And then when that happened, um, his fortune was just gone because like a lot of wealthy Southerners, um, when the Union Army took over Chattanooga, everything was just confiscated. Everything became the property of the government. Um, William had, had uh, purchased tobacco a long time before that, and he had stored it in a warehouse because he, his plan was, hey, I'm going to sell this when the, when the time is right and we're going to make a lot of money. And he would have except that the Union Army came in and everybody's fortunes got wiped out. But the thing about Reconstruction is this, everyone's fortune got wiped out, but white people did not lose their place in line. When the government began to, when they began Reconstruction, which really means trying to put back together what has been destroyed or dismantled, when they began to do that, the first thing they wanted to do was re-embrace the uh, whites, the Southern whites who had seceded from the, from the Union. Um, they weren't so concerned about whether Black people were gathered into the bosom. So even though white people lost their fortune too, um, they did not lose their place in line. So they were able to kind of um, recoup much, much faster. Whereas William, who had been a very successful, very wealthy um, blacksmith owner, um, suddenly had to go on a pension. He didn't even have $300 
um, to his name. And he and his wife had to live off of a pension. So with reconstruction, especially with African-Americans, you might have had a fortune yesterday, but you don't know what you would have had today. Um, and again, yes, there were Blacks who were in higher positions, um, who were trying um, very valiantly to make a difference and to um, bring Black people up to that equality with white people. There were Blacks doing that, but the everyday Black did not feel that. They didn't, they just tried to make it on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, oh, sorry, go so, ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, no, no problem. Well, with um, me... Also, Rita, what it would be like the, the and Michelle talks about this in <clears throat> too, it was the issue of the land, that Black people didn't have land and that there was a, and in reconstruction, that that was a huge issue, especially with legislation and working and, and the congressmen and senators were working towards that. So Rita, that, that also um, coincides with your points as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. He had property. Um, he did not have a lot of land, but he did have property. He had three locations um, and he had a warehouse full of tobacco. But in the end, he lost it all because of the, in the Civil War and then afterward because of Reconstruction. But of all that I've said, I just feel that Black history is just so important because every year there's a wider gap between what happened and the, the new reality. It seems, I am a former teacher and I saw it happening when I was teaching. It just seems that for the young people, this becomes a line in a book. You know, that there's, there, you have to find a way to um, help them to understand or to connect with what really happened. This is something that really happened um, to people. And I would like to say one more thing, if I, if I may. Sure, you know, sure. um, I have been contacted um, by relatives of William Lewis's from both sides of the ocean. And it was, they thought, they found me, I didn't find them. Uh, back in 2017, the great granddaughter of William's grandson contacted me. I had been posting about uh, William Lewis and I posted a picture of his son holding his grandson on his lap. All I knew about that grandson was that he grew up and moved to Paris, that's all I knew about him. And I put what I knew on my website. And in 2017, a woman from France named Charlotte contacted me and told me she was the great granddaughter of William's grandson. And she told me all about uh, that, that little boy's name was Charlie. I have, she's shown me a website that she's building. Charlie became a piano player, a conductor, he was in movies over in France. I've got all of that um, from her. She wants to kind of keep it quiet now. That's fine. That's, a, that's another whole story. But in the meantime, that was 2017. Well, last year in 2021, a man from Maryland wrote me and said, I am the great grandson of William's grandson. And he said that he was looking for his family and that he thanked me for what I put on my website. I was so excited. I told him about Charlotte in, in France. And he said, well, isn't that odd? Because I speak French. He said, I've always loved French. So I was able to bring the two of them together and they've been sharing stories. And I asked them, if, if you do anything, please keep me in the loop. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm loving this, but yeah, it's um, it's it's the everyday uh, African American um, that I'm most interested in writing about because actually we all are heroes of our own story. Every one of us are, and right. so for me, I just like giving that 15 minutes of fame to people who didn't get it the first time around. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you so much, Rita. We all learned such an incredible amount from the from what you just shared. Um, so there are 
so many ways to use hammering for freedom in, in your classroom. But with Michelle's book and with Rita's book, it's a really wonderful way to tie in um, primary sources. So like Rita had mentioned, she was at the library really digging deep into the archives, into books that may or may not have been in circulation. So really imparting that knowledge on students, I think is so important and using actual documents um, and not just textbooks on curating and developing their own research. So um, you can learn more about that in the Hammering for Freedom Teacher's Guides about others, um, other people who were enslaved that fought their freedom. Um, and you can find the Teacher's Guide. All of our Teacher's Guides are for free on our website. And now we are going to hear from Michelle. We heard from Michelle before about the reconstruction history. And now she's going to provide some details, specific details about her wonderful novel, Black Was the Ink. Thank you. Um, so this is the cover for Black Was the Ink. If you guys uh, look at the in the background, um, the main character, his name is Malcolm, and he's a, a modern day uh, African-American teenage boy from D.C. And behind him, you can see a picture of the U.S. Capitol and um, the pages floating up to form a thought cloud above his head are actually pages from his ancestor's diary. And that is how he first encounters his, um, his ancestor and starts learning about this reconstruction period and ends up taking a fantastical journey himself to the reconstruction era where he walks in his ancestor's shoes and experiences all of the amazing things that um, his, his ancestor was experiencing. Um, my inspiration for writing the book was actually the Mother Emanuel Massacre. And I was on maternity leave uh, with my second son from my job as a civil rights attorney um, in the summer of 2015 when the massacre occurred. And like so, so many people, um, you know, I was just horrified by the events. And um, in, in particular, you know, I was horrified that such a young person, a teenager, um, could commit such a horrific crime against people that had done nothing to him and had in fact welcomed, them, welcomed him into their church while they were um, in the midst of a Bible study. Um, and because of that incident, I started doing some research into the Mother Emanuel Church, and I found out some things that were just really surprising to me and, um, and, and really uh, inspirational. And I, one of those things was that the church was founded by a man named Denmark Vesey, who uh, was the leader of one of the largest attempted slave revolts in U.S. history down in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And, um, and, and Mr. Vesey, um, you know, his slave revolt was not successful and he was uh, he was killed along with all of his um, co-conspirators but uh, a few years before this attempted slave revolt he had founded the predecessor church to mother Emanuel um, and uh, Charleston in South Carolina after the attempted slave revolt um, as many other states did when there were slave revolts is they passed laws and ordinances that prohibited the enslaved people from practicing their religion because they realized that they were using the church as a place to organize organize against their oppressors. And um, the, the congregants of the church, they continued to meet in secret all the way up until the end of the Civil War. And then once slavery was abolished for the first time, they were able to build a brick and mortar church. And um, it's not actually the same building that they're in today because that building burnt down in the 1890s. But, um, but the, the picture here, the depiction here is of the present um, Mother Emanuel Church. Um, and uh, another fascinating thing was that when the church was built, it was actually built by a descendant of, of Denmark uh, Vesey. And so I thought that was fascinating. But then another thing that was fascinating was during the Reconstruction era, the pastor of the church was a man named Richard uh, Kane. And he was also one of the first Black people elected to Congress. He was in that group of 16 who served in the, in the 1870s. Um, and then I, I found other things out about the church, like Booker uh, T. Washington had spoken there and Coretta Scott King had led a protest from the church's steps. And, um, and even the sitting pastor at the time of the massacre was a man um, named Clementa Pinckney, who was also a uh, sitting member of the South Carolina State Senate. And, and, and I found the church to be a very fascinating vehicle to look at American history and look at, you know, all the different periods that we've experienced, and in particular, the, um, the attempts of 
of full liberation of Black people and looking at it um, from slavery all the way to the present and saw the church as a through line. And so that's what motivated me to tell a multi-generational story that looks back at um, Black people's struggle for freedom and to um, have a character in the present day who's dealing with modern frustrations that so many um, people experience with America's racial dynamics and um, contrast that to what it was like when Black people were first emerging from slavery. Mm. Wow. Thank you so much, Michelle. And as I mentioned with Hammering for Freedom, we also have a guide for Black Was the Ink. I also wanted to highlight one of the activities that uses primary sources again, because these books just present such wonderful opportunities for students to engage with real authentic material and primary sources. Capital Men, uh, The Epic Story of Reconstruction was a wonderful, wonderful book. That is a must um, for middle and high school courses teaching about reconstruction and the reconstruction documentary on PBS um, by Henry Louis Gates uh, Jr. is also uh, check it out and those would be wonderful for students to engage with. And this book, uh, you can find the teacher's guide online um, on our website when you type in and search for the book title and you'll see it there. I'm going to go through these resources really quickly because I want to make sure that we have some time at the end for some question and answer. So uh, this is um, through the Zen Education Project. It's a report that examines um, Reconstruction's place in state social studies standards, and it was just released how we as a country have done such a disservice to teaching reconstruction in our classrooms. So I highly recommend you checking it out and reading about it and making sure that in whatever social studies course or environment that you're in, that you're examining the ways that you're talking about reconstruction and teaching it and making sure that we are covering it correctly um, and authentically. And re, uh, the Zen Education Project also has some more uh, general resources dedicated to teaching reconstruction on their website. So again, I encourage you to, to look at those. Uh, Michelle also shared with me this new exhibit, Make Good the Promises at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. So this is a great way to, to virtually explore the exhibit and how it examines reconstruction, what happened and also connecting to today. So that's also another resource. We have a full list of relevant books that go through certain um, periods in history relating to, um, pertaining to actual reconstruction and periods before and after. Uh, you can check out this online. You will also get it in the email blast that we send out. There is a whole list of links and books at the end that can inform your work as well. So it's not just books, it also contains resources and links to other information. And the book list can, and collection can also be found out on our website. You'll also get this link in the email as well. So we have about 10 minutes and we are going to start with the first question that, that someone asked that I would love for both Rita and Michelle to answer. Um, and it's, there are multiple parts to the question. So, but I think that you all will find it, their answers very valuable. So how can educators, librarians, families become more comfortable using resources like your beautiful books in whatever work you're doing? Specifically, how they can they become more familiar with this period of American history so that they feel confident teaching and using these books. I think that the confidence piece is really critical to teaching reconstruction. So Rita, can you start us off? You know what, the last part of the question, and believe me, 10 minutes does not do this question a service, but we will do our best in, um, you know, what resources did you find in your work, whether you were developing your book or in your teaching past and in Michelle, your, your career as a lawyer, you know, what resources have you found in your own work that you wish that every person in America would have when they're teaching 
and learning about this history. So Rita, start us off. That's a lot. (laughs) Well, it is a lot, but I will tell you as a former teacher, um, I loved it when people spoke my, my language. You know, we have to learn to speak each other's language. Teachers are so busy. And when you bring them a book and say, hey, we've got a new book, teachers don't have time to read that book. But they would sure appreciate it if you would say, we have a new book that really touches on reconstruction or it touches on uh, what it was like in everyday life during the Civil War or what it was like um, while Black people were in power for a brief period of time. I think teachers would love for you to find out what it is that they really do. Not just tell them what you do, but find out what it is that they do, what it is they're talking about, and then bring those two together if you can. Um, For me, I will say I have been reviewing books for over 20 years. And when I first started reviewing for the New, New York Journal of Books, They never understood why I always put a big recommendation at the end for teachers. And I told them, you watch, it's going to catch on. And it did catch on because teachers, well, like we all do, teachers needed time. They needed time. And um, if you could save them some time, they just really loved you. So what I wish we would do is uh, to learn to speak each other's language, find out what is it really that teachers are teaching, and then see if you have written a book or if you have run across a book that either emphasizes that or also it could be a book that totally leaves it out. That would be a good book for that subject too because how is that gonna affect um, the people in the book? For instance, um, in Hammering for Freedom, uh, I would probably tell teachers that this is a good book to teach about community and about citizenship about the power of love, the power of the family. Are you still a family if you're not all together? I mean, these are concepts that I would pull out of that book and tell the teacher because I know that they have to deal with that every day because I'm a former teacher and I had to deal with that with my students. So I would say learn to speak each other's language if you can. I think it would be very beneficial. Thanks so much, Rita. You're um, I, w- I would just add, in addition to uh, some of the resources that you pointed out on a couple of <clears throat> slides back, um, the uh, Netflix also has a show called A Men that Will Smith uh, put together on the Reconstruction Era, and it it also focuses a lot on um, the it, on the significance of the Reconstruction Amendments and the Fourteenth Amendment in particular, and what that meant for. Um, you know, for African Americans that were gaining citizenship rights for the first time. So I would say try to look at um, uh, movies or documentaries that maybe help this period come alive. So you start feeling more comfortable, um, you know, as you're also reading books. Um, but the, yes, the PBS Reconstruction Special, you know, does a does a great job of bringing this period alive. Um, and and so. Uh, yeah, and so uh, you know, looking at the the teachers guides, they're really they're really excellent resources. They provide lots of activities and ways that you can engage your students. And you know, maybe if you read the teachers guide before you read the book, you um, it it just might it might be a helpful tool um, to have next to you while you're reading the book that explains certain concepts and um, and helps you see different ways to engage with the with the materials. So um, I think this question will probably take us to the end, but I think it's a good, I think it's a good time to to connect it. So this this history, unfortunately, you know, Reconstruction history, unfortunately, is not is not taught across the country. And of course, with the critical race theory and issues surrounding that, you know, what what does that look like? You know, Michelle, could you get take us through how to talk about teaching this history and also combating critical race theory criticisms and conversations with families, with educators about that? Yeah, so I mean, one thing that I would say is that, um, you know, when you look at something, an event that happened in history, um, 
there's there's never just one perspective on that event. And I think if you want to get closer to the truth, it's really important to think about how different communities may have experienced that same event. Um, there's a really great quote from Chino Achebe, uh, the prominent Nigerian author who wrote Things Fall Apart. And he said, until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And so I think one of the great things that you guys can do as educators is to help your students think critically about what they're reading and to think about not just what's being said but what's not being said and what's missing from the text and whose perspective is missing from the text and I think reading um, you know stories that present those different viewpoints will um, you know will help them become stronger thinkers and better researchers and um and better americans and i think also looking at history from different perspectives and viewpoints it also enables us to learn from our history and you know people say those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it um, and I think many of us today are tired of repeating um, some of the worst aspects of American history over and over. Um, but until we dig in and try to figure out what are those lessons, what can we learn, um, you know, how can we how can we see the whole story, um, you know, then it's going to be really hard uh, for us to do better in the future. And that was one of my goals in writing this book. It, it you know, I was actually seeing a um, a, a repeat of the collapse of reconstruction when I started writing it. That's what that's what the Mother Emanuel massacre triggered for me. Um, you know, I was like, how could this possibly be happening in 2015? This isn't 1960. This isn't 1860. How could things like this still be happening? And um, and so I, I wanted to write something that could help people look at this history and draw lessons from it so that we could make better choices in the future. Wow, thank you so much, Michelle. Rita, did you want to add anything on to Michelle's thoughts? Absolutely not. I was gonna say what Michelle said because it's so <laughs> thorough. It really is, it yeah. is so thorough. I, the portion she said about, uh, if you don't remember history, you're doomed to repeat it. That was one of my major notes there. And um, it is so true. You know, it may seem cliche, but it is so true that if you are not even aware of where you came from and what happened, then what's to stop it from happening again? So what Michelle said, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, I think that's a great way to conclude. Wow, in the, I mean, we have had such amazing comments in the chat for you both that you have shared such incredible knowledge with us today, how much people have really learned, how much I have learned um, from listening to you both, from your both of your wonderful books. Please check out Black Was the Ink and Hammering for Freedom. And as always, we are so appreciative of your time and energy in, in doing this with us today and sharing what you have to offer with our community. So thank you both so much. Uh, you all will be hearing from us shortly with the email within the week with the email to the link to the recording and all of the, the resources. So hope you all stay healthy and have a great, great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, everyone. And you can check out their websites here. Um, and please follow us on social media or sign up for our e-news so you can learn more about any of our future upcoming programming and other uh, wonderful anecdotes about our books. So thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.